Welcome to another what went down video. So I'll be going through or over what happened in the past week when it comes to the financial markets and then what we expect going into the new week, right? So starting off with the US, uh, we had of course CPI data. We had both CPI, which is consumer price index as well as PPI. Consumer price index, all figures uh, came in greater than expected, of course, except the core CPI monthly, which came in at 0 0.3 as expected. Essentially, what are we getting from this? Uh, the, the, the report was obviously hawkish and it was pushing away further or pushing further away the speculation of a nearer and larger FOMC rate cuts, also diminishing such expectations, right? Of course, it's one reading that that came in greater than expected. But it, will, it won't have much of a shift in terms of market pricing or expectations. But if we're taking it at face value, it is giving us that, that there is sort of a pushback because inflation is not just in a straight downward trajectory, right? Especially when it comes to CPI. And if we look, and when I looked at the Fed Watch tool at that point, it was still pricing in 97.4%, or it, it was pricing in 97.4% probabilities of a rate hold in January. And of course, that is what we're expecting. And then nothing much had changed in the March meeting. They were still expecting a rate cut, right? Over 60% probability of a rate cut. So like I said, it's not going to shift market pricing that much, but it was something that something to take note of, especially remembering that we also saw uh we understand that the labor market is also still tight right but another thing to also take note of which i did i forgot to add here is that inflation expectations have been going down we saw that in the in the university of michigan uh, data that we had the latest data that we had and we're also having that data coming in on friday so we'll also be looking and paying attention to those inflation expectations we had the five year and the first in the five year and the one year inflation expectations actually drop uh, and then, of course, just the general U.S. inflation expectations, those also showed a drop, right? So that is also headed in the right direction. And then, of course, the Fed might not might eventually have to cut rates as much as the market is pricing in. But from my from my expectations or from my observations, sorry, uh, I feel that March is too soon. Maybe we might get that in the second in the second uh, in the second quarter or. At, mo or at least in the in the second half of 2024 right and then we also had ppi which is producer price index the figures came in below expectations those were pointing in the di in the right direction heading in the right direction and of course supporting market expectations of a fed pivot and a fed cut eventually in march right so that is what we had there and then if we go into uh, some global threats, so I wrote here as well some global threats uh, to pay attention to uh, as we kick off 2024. Of course, this this is why I'm just focusing on the geopolitical side of things. I didn't cover everything on the geopolitical sphere, but I just covered what is most obvious, right? So ongoing Russia and Ukraine war, uh, that is still there, that is still no end in sight. And then we also have the Israel-Hamas war, which is taking the headlines at the, at the moment. Uh, that is also still ongoing and this and this has resulted in what in Iran proxies like the Houthis and Hezbollah <coughs> in Lebanon getting involved and now turning this into a wider regional conflict as they stand with Hamas right so the Houthi attacks against international maritime vessels in the Red Sea which started I think November last year uh, has caused some supply chain disruptions forcing some companies to suspend operations via the Red Sea and some to travel via Cape Town which is a more costly and longer route, about 10 days more. Uh, and then on that day, uh, we had the US and the British militaries launch uh, strikes against Houthi rebels in Yemen, hitting over 60 targets. And uh, of course, this was after weeks of actually, instead of, ta of, of hitting back or launching strikes against the Houthis, they were only intercepting missiles as well as drones that the Houthis were shooting towards uh, maritime vessels in the Red Sea, right? So that uh, so they eventually retaliated, if I may call it retaliation. Uh, but then, of course, the Houthis did not take that line down. They said uh, everyone involved will dearly pay for it. They will dearly answer for this. And of course, a further escalation is a possibility there. And if we do get that, then we understand. I've been talking about this for some time. We understand that that would obviously impact what impact oil prices, impact the price of gold. And of course, that could create a risk of environment where there is uncertainty of how further this can actually escalate. Because if the now, if because before it was just Israel, right? Now it is U.S., British, and well, we, there were also some countries involved in this. Uh, in this, uh, how can I put it? In this, 
in this how can i put it in this uh but not okay forgot that the actual word that i wanted to use in this joint strike joint that's the word i wanted to use in this joint strike we also had canada netherlands i think australia as well but a couple of other countries who are who were for this as well right so if the if the houthis actually retaliate then who knows how far how far, how further this can escalate will they retaliate to only the the, the navy which is in the red sea which has which actually launched the airstrikes or will they retaliate to any american wherever they may be so nobody knows so that the, those are the fears or those, those are the thoughts group and they can do whatever they want to do right so those are the fears and the thoughts that if they say they are going to retaliate because immediately after that not immediately after but on that and that on the following day i think there were over thousands and thousands that were marching on the streets of 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 of, of yemen uh in support of of of, of the houthis in support of saying that the u.s needs to answer they even burnt flags of the u.s and, and and israel of u.s and israel so that is showing the support that they have for the houthis so who knows how how much of an escalation it will be how much of a retaliation it will be and how much it can potentially spread right so that was definitely going to create uncertainty and then we also had a a hijacking or a seize uh, a seizure of a um or a maritime vessel which carries oil a cargo ship was actually seized in the red sea by the houthis obviously uh so that of course it's it's an oil cargo and it was supposed to transport oil to wherever it had to transport it to but then since it has been hijacked obviously it will just exacerbate the situation right so <clears throat> in history so and then on a side note as well we also had a south africa present a case uh in the uh, that the war in gaza amounts to genocide against palestinians <laughs> yes uh israel had defended itself at the at the united nations top court calling the case one of great of the greatest shows of hip hypocrisy in history i won't really comment much about that but then what global effects will this have besides the obvious which is an escalation in the, in the middle east tensions like i've just explained uh retaliations from the houthis this should send oil and gold prices higher oil output was already trimmed by opec and a full involvement of iran will cause oil prices to soar higher and in doing so will increase inflationary pressures at a time when central banks or when when central banks thought they were winning the fight against demand side inflation right this will result in a cost push side inflation right so not demand side essentially to a certain extent it, it will add uh, demand uh because because it if it if if container ships as well they're not only carrying oil right so container ships whatever goods they're carrying uh then if they don't get to their destinations on time then it will cut off supply or it will reduce the supply of that so eventually it will feed into inflation right or increase inflationary pressures so that is what we have there and remember also bp was one of the first uh oil transporters who actually terminated uh or were like they won't they won't be transporting their oil via the red sea obviously early in november so that also had an a shock to the oil prices but then of course they eventually balance things out uh so <clears throat> uh, this will also like i said it will, this will also create an environment of global uncertainty where we can see investors flight into safe haven assets gold bonds jpy and dollar of course this is where gold comes into the spotlight no pun intended uh in this case everything that glitters is gold uh it's used as a hedge against high inflation since it's a good storage of value and also in times of uncertainty investors stockpile the precious metal is a safe haven asset so that will also cause uh the further it escalates the further gold prices will, will rise because capital will be moving into gold right and of course oil won't really be benefiting because of the uncertainty environment but because it's going to impact the supply of oil leaving demand high right <clears throat> so but we, we we we're not expecting that much of a rise in price because remember there was already a global slowdown in terms of the demand of oil yes it will push oil higher but it it would i don't i'm not expecting that much of a rise in price as it would if it were in a case where global demand was still high but then supply was just cut off because of the war then that would really cause oil prices to soar but they will go up right and then if inflationary pressures uh increase then the bank of japan might soon pivot and we get a hike in interest rates or abandonment of the yield curve control higher wages negotiations in march or april 
and benefiting from the flows of being a safe haven asset, right? So um, essentially, I'm not saying buy oil, gold, and JPY, but rather pay attention to them. But also the Japanese yen, if we're seeing inflationary pressures heightened, then that could also feed into the Japanese economy. And then, of course, we know we are watching them closely. We're paying attention to them and keeping a close eye on them because I still think they might be the biggest trade for 2024, which is going long the Japanese yen, right? Then if we look at China, <clears throat> I spoke a bit about the Chinese economy. Uh, essentially, what is happening? Uh, yeah. So it really essentially why it's struggling uh, to boost growth and demand is the fact that it, I, I stated is the fact that inflation is in a deflationary trend with core sitting at 0 0.6 and headline at negative 0 0.5. The one year loan prime rate, which is the medium term lending facility used to corporate household loans used used at used for corporate and household loans sitting at 3.45 percent and the five year rate a reference for mortgages sitting at 4.2 percent. The MLF, which is the medium term lending facility, which is essentially the rate or the main interest rate between uh, central or that central banks use to lend to commercial banks that's sitting at 2.5. Uh, we also have an interest rate decision of that or a, a, a decision on the MLF and it is expected to be cut by 10 basis points. That's 0 0.1. Yeah, that's 0 0.1, 0 0.1 percent. So yeah. But essentially what might be the issue, this leaves the real interest rates high, right? So interest rates adjusted for, for, in, for in, well, rates adjusted for the effects of inflation at high levels, meaning that the borrowing costs are actually high and not low. How? Well, real interest rates, it is the nominal interest rates minus inflation. So if the nominal interest rates are remaining at high levels, but inflation is dropping, that means that the real interest rate remains high, right? So essentially borrowing costs are still high. So even if they... Even if it might seem as if the economy or the People's Bank of China is easing the economy, uh, but essentially borrowing costs are still remaining high. So that is not enticing to who? To borrowers, right? Uh, so to uh, so in this case, China, as inflation falls to negative, while rates remain at 3.45% or in the MLF remaining at 25 uh, it leaves the real interest rates or costs of, of, uh, costs of funds to a borrower at a high level. The People's Bank of China is under pressure to cut interest rates as falling inflation raises real borrowing costs for private businesses and households, curbing investments, hiring and consumer spending, right? So all these things are not extremely inflationary or they're not in a, they, they, they are not supportive or promoting what uh, economic activity, which will eventually boost growth or, or, of, of the economy, right? So demand, due, demand for credit also remains weak. And the turmoil in the property sector is not doing any justice to the situation. Obviously, demand will remain weak if borrowing costs are high, right? So stronger demand and growth and economic growth is needed to reverse the deflationary trend. A combination of monetary easing, supportive fiscal policy and, stru and structural reforms are all integral to steer the ship in the right direction. So that is essential on the Chinese economy. Then if we look at... This is all based on last week, just a recap on last week. And then if you look at what we're expecting this week, as you can see, this is just a snapshot of the week ahead. Uh, we have China MLF, uh, one-year MLF rate, like I said, expected a 10 basis point cut from 2.5 to 2.4. Uh, okay, let's just use this. Uh, so yeah, you can look at this, but let's just use the actual calendar to make things easier and quicker. And then we also, this is Monday. Remember, it's a holiday as well tomorrow in the US. Then we also have Westpac consumer confidence uh, expected for to increase to 82.5 from 82.1. We have the unemployment rate for the UK. Excuse me, guys. Uh, that is expected to increase to 4.3 from 4.2. We have the ZEW economic index for Euro as well as Germany. That is expected to improve from 12.8 to 15. That will be a slight a positive for the Euro economy. Uh, and then we also have CAD inflation expected to actually increase from 3.1 to 3.5 core from 2 or remain unchanged at 2.8 monthly monthly rates or monthly figures drop to negative 0 0.2 in the headline and then a drop to negative 0 0.3 in the monthly right so that will show what deflationary pressure or disinflation not deflationary but disinflation uh, so yeah, we'll also be paying attention to that on Tuesday. And then of course, Wednesday we'll have the China GDP growth rate for the fourth quarter. 
uh, that is expected to climb to 5.3 from 4.9 and then we'll also have inflation rate for the UK uh, that is expected to climb to or to drop to 3.7 from 3.9 core to drop to 4.8 from 5.1 if we see that and we see easing in in the inflationary pressures of the UK then we, that might we might see a fall in the U, in the UK economy right so a sell off in the UK economy essentially uh and then if we look at ecp we also have inflation rate uh these are the final readings expected to come in at 2.9 from 2.4 this is the final i think that the, the previous reading was also 2.9 if i'm not mistaken but this will be the final one uh and then inflation rate core expected to drop to 3.4 from 3.6 and of course if inflation if inflation comes in below the previous readings or what is expected then we could see a sell-off in the euro and the pound if they come in greater then we might see an appreciation in that right in the euro or the pound right uh, so then we'll also have retail sales uh, of course we also have south africa retail sales as well and then we we'll also have a couple we also have a couple of fed uh, speakers as well as ecb as you can see if you look at the snapshot here those are included uh, but for this type, for this one, I'm just paying more attention to the data side of things. Uh, we also have uh, in, uh, in Australia on Thursday, we also have uh, labor data. Also have uh, unemployment or employment is expected to come in at uh, 20K from 61.5K previously. So a, a 20,000 jobs added. Unemployment to remain unchanged at 3.9. Uh, and then we'll also have euro ecp monetary policy meeting accounts uh then building permits uh on thursday as well for the us those expected to come in essentially at 1.48 million from 1.46 or 1.47 uh million uh, and then we'll also have on f thursday not much actually that that we can really pay attention to okay new zealand uh, business pmi that is essential as well slight tick up to 47.8 still in contraction territory uh so yeah that's essentially what we get from there and then lastly on friday we'll have the japanese inflation uh which the market will be paying attention to like i said uh, because if you're getting an inflation show pushing higher that is positive for the for the for the japanese yen but if inflation keeps dropping lower that is viewed as not being in a stable manner above the target so we might see a sell-off right in the japanese yen and that would push the possibility of a of an interest rate hike or a tightening of financial conditions in the japanese economy further into the future if inflation becomes comes in weaker but if it comes in stronger and hotter then it might slightly nudge that a bit a bit closer right uh so that is what we have and then retail sales of the gbp retail sales and then like i said friday michigan consumer sentiment uh, expected to come in at uh, 69 from 69.7 previously so a slight drop there uh, and then of course michigan five-year inflation expectations expected to come in at 2.9 as expect or unchanged and then um, where's the one year one michigan consumer Okay, Michigan inflation expectations, those expected to come in at 3.1 unchanged, right? So that is what we'll have on Friday. So that is what we have going into the new week. Uh, and that is the data that we'll be focusing on, right? So nothing much has really changed. It's still early in the year. It's still like what? It's the, going into the third week of, uh, of January. So not really much of a significant change. Uh, in terms of of the markets, uh, in terms of the data, but we'll still be looking forward to all the data that is to come, right? And then these are just a couple of positions that I have running. Uh, so of course I'm still in my AUD NZD short uh, position, uh, GBP JPY. I'm also short on that. Uh, of course I scaled out of my position, but I'm still short. I'm still holding. Uh, I'll be looking for scaling in opportunities uh, if the market presents those to me, right? So let's let's wait for it to load here. So I'm still short on GBP JPY and then I'm also still long on uh, US 500. As you can see here, I'm still long on US 500, still have my buy position from last year. And then when it comes to another one, 
GBP USD. I'm still short on GBP USD. Also looking for opportunities to scale in. Uh, so I'm still short from one from one three uh, on GBP USD. I'm looking for an opportunity to scale in around these levels. And then lastly, I have Bitcoin, of which I'm now risk free on Bitcoin. I went short on Bitcoin, obviously with the hype of the ETF. Uh, I thought I'd just take the opposite side, <laughs> but yeah, I'm short there. Bit uh, a bit. How can I? Ambitious uh, to expect that price might fall to. 32,000 uh, but yeah I'm just holding I'm risk free so I'll see how we'll see how things develop right obviously I'm more long term bullish uh, but for now I, I just thought that we would have that uh, retracement and that pullback right when it comes to Bitcoin so essentially those are the positions that I currently have running at the moment and yeah uh, we'll wrap it up for today's uh, what went down video and that is what we'll be looking forward to going into the week ahead, right? So here's that snapshot for the last time, what to expect in the days to come, right? So yeah, have a good week and a very profitable week.